Mitochondria is a powerhouse of the cell. I know at least 75% of the people in this room had flashbacks to middle and high school when hearing that. And that's because it's been embedded in our minds throughout our education. For me, the term Gilded Age has been stuck in my head since high school American history. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the topic, allow me to drop some knowledge on my favorite term. So this guy, Mark Twain, wrote a book way back in 1875 called The Gilded Age to describe America's state between Civil War and World War I. During this time, our economy and immigration was rising exponentially. However, beneath the progress we were making as a nation, it was an era of serious social and political turmoil. Now, I have no idea why this phrase lingered in the back of my mind even after my exam had passed on it. But because it wasn't relevant in my high school world, not in my perfect little bubble, until it was. I went to a prestigious school that boasted diversity as their core. And as you can see in the top line, it was highly diverse. So throughout my boarding school experience, my mom, a petite middle-aged woman, always covered head to toe in an abaya would sometimes bring me dinner. It was always some kind of strong curry that would take up my entire room. And that's not to say that my room like, smelled like fresh linen and flowers all the time, because that's not the case. There was always like a week old pizza box near my like, bed and ramen cup noodles everywhere. But one evening, I was done with the curry scent taking over because it wasn't helping my hip American teen brand that I was trying to pull off. So I called her up and I was like, Amma, please don't bring that chicken curry up here. I'll meet you in the gardens. And so after dinner was over, by the way, it was like really good curry. <laughs> but after dinner was over, my sister and my mom, they offered me a ride back to the dorms. And on our way to the car, we saw a group of teenagers run past us, get into a car, and scream, Allahu Akbar, and screech off. We all stopped in shock. On our quick ride back to the dorms, we stayed silent until I was about to leave, and my sister turned back to me and said, Shakira, be safe, and you should tell someone what just happened. I didn't respond to her request, and I went up to my, feel went up to my room feeling a little off. So I decided that a good run would cure the odd feeling that was creeping into my stomach. As I was running through the school grounds, I was surrounded by five guys, and fear washed over my body as my feeble attempts to push past these guys was useless because I was shoved to the ground. And that's when the yelling began. You effing raghead, you don't belong here, followed with a Go back to your country. And a dog barked in the distance, and the boys stopped yelling, and they left the same way they came. And I stayed on the ground in fetal position, thinking, how could words hurt so much? I heard of incidents like this happen before, but I never thought it would happen to me. And when I brought it up to my school, and changes needed to be made, they looked at me in disbelief, because it was just one person against an entire community. And that's when I realized I was a visitor. I was a visitor, and I overstayed my welcome. I couldn't call that place home anymore. So I graduated, and summer after senior year, I taught myself to be OK with being a South Asian Muslim. And it paid off when I entered college, and I was exposed to such a diverse community. Almost everyone I spoke to was an immigrant or first-generation kid like myself. <clears throat> oh, sorry. <laughs> and I was a little insecure about making friends, even though I accepted myself for who I was. But I stepped out of my comfort zone, and I finally made a friend. And we bonded over, wait for it, memes. <laughs> Every day was a routine. 
when I woke up, in between classes, before I fell asleep, I was scrolling through my Instagram DMs to see if this kid was like sending me the latest memes. And we covered everything through memes, from politics to relationships. And that's when I realized I liked him. And he liked a girl that wasn't me. <laughs> Typical plot twist to any good romantic comedy, right? So the story goes on. And I was a little short on friends, so I didn't tell him that I liked him in case it would push him away. And instead, I became his wingman and gave him tips on how to woo over his crush. Thankfully for me, my coaching didn't help. <laughs> And when things didn't go as planned with his crush, the next day, I made the most romantic gesture an 18-year-old woman can make. And I slid him a note reading, hey, I like you. <laughs> Want to go out sometime? And he looked at me, he shrugged, and he nonchalantly replied with, yeah, sure. And for me, that was like saying happily ever after. <laughs> Except we all know that rom-coms don't end there. And there's usually a force of evil that comes between the romance. Usually in a form of a person, but this time an idea came between us and our communities, communities defended it. He came from a devout Hindu family and I have a strong Muslim background. And in immigrant communities, interfaith relationships don't usually work out well. He and I used to always joke about traditional values. We always knew it would be a minor inconvenience, but our relationship was bigger than touching our heads to the ground or lighting some fires. And because it brought so much trouble, our parents didn't allow for us to continue. And neither of us could be mad at them because this belief that two people from different religions shouldn't be together was bigger than us, and it was bigger than our parents. It was something that was embedded in their minds from ages ago. I was hurt when I was left out in my boarding school environment, but this time it hit harder because this was a community that he and I were born into. Because we weren't on the same spiritual level, we would be shunned from our homes. And that's when I realized that they see immigrant communities don't expose racism within our own culture, and we hide what doesn't look good. And so, I didn't get my fairy tale ending, and my relationship ended with this guy we'll name X, pun intended. <laughs> but this time, there isn't anything for me to accept. I'm not assimilating to a culture like I did in high school. And I realized that I was done with old generational rules controlling my life decisions. And, according to this data, a lot of other people are done. From the Pew Research Survey done in 2015, we found that less than 20% of Americans before 1960 were in a relationship with a partner belonging to another faith. But, since 2010, nearly 40% of Americans reported their significant other practice a different religion. And that makes sense, because America's a melting pot, and it's impossible not to mingle with other races, religions, and people, so it adds up. <clears throat> so I've accepted that we are in the Gilded Age, but following the Gilded Age came the Progressive Era, where people took stand, a stand against political and social issues and forced reform. And now we can acknowledge that there is an issue with our definition of inclusiveness in communities that we belong to. And I'm passionate about not letting future generations having this problem. What if we broke the cycle of practicing conditional inclusiveness and took a stand against the culture that encourages us to pick our differences that divide us? Imagine how far the human race could evolve if we made a conscious effort to practice open-mindedness. And I know there's a long journey ahead of us to change minds, but we have the power to make decisions with the lessons we've learned and be reborn into a new generation who can truly be inclusive of people with different backgrounds. Thank you.